Live from the Julia Morgan Ballroom in San Francisco. Extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube. Covering Structure 2015. Now your host, George Gilbert. This is George Gilbert. Uh, we're at the iconic Structure 2015 conference. This is the Cube's exclusive coverage. Um, we are, are uh, uh, we have a special guest with us, uh, Jim Donaldson, and uh, Jonathan Donaldson. John Jonathan Donaldson. I knew I was going to mess that up. Hey, can we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Busy so, venue. Yeah, a little. Uh, all right. We'll, we'll have a little humor mixed in. Um, all right. So, Jonathan is uh, um, a guru on all things software defined in, in Intel infrastructure. Um, why don't you tell us, Jonathan, about the, um, the sequence of compute infrastructure right. or data center infrastructure that went software defined and what mm -hmm. that meant? Yeah, so obviously, you know, if you go back and you look at kind of the evolution of this, right? Yeah. You started with the virtualization of the compute itself. How do I get you know, virtual machines on a server? How do I get the, the one server to look like many? Yeah. And that brought along with it you know, certain challenges. Okay, so then how do I then go programmatically orchestrate the networking for that, right? So if I'm going to move these virtual machines around or I'm going to really try and uh, drive my operational uh, cost down significantly, I have to start to do that programmatic uh, automation of each of those components over time. And so compute was the first one, right? We saw things like DRS from VMware uh, and vSphere come out. And then DRS meaning uh, disaster recovery service? No, uh, dynamic uh, resource scheduling. Right? Oh, so it's okay. So it's their automated scheduler for how do I move around those virtual machines in okay. my cluster environment to have the best performance, right? To okay. take things out of, uh, you know, put them into maintenance mode so I can go replace things, that sort of thing. And then we started to see that same sort of trend in the networking side, and that became software-defined networking. So how can I take, you know, my switches and my routers, and, and uh, when I move a workload, programmatically move, you know, the IP addresses and all the security features and load balancing things along with it. And then we saw, now we're seeing the, the trend for that also on the storage side, right? So if I have, you know, SAN-based storage attached to some compute nodes, and that's where my data is uh, predominantly, it's really hard to then to go migrate those workloads elsewhere uh, in the cluster. And so we're Not just programmatically, but because you have bandwidth limitations. Right, so bandwidth limitations, programmatic limitations, you know, how do I open up more of the pipe on a programmatic basis when I know that I have a migration event that I've got to go do. And so it's really kind of stitching together all of those components that really is driving the value. Does one vendor have to provide all those programmatic interfaces? Or, um, or if multiple vendors try, will they sort of step on each other? So I think the you know what we're seeing in the industry is you know things like OpenStack are trying to build that kind of you know predominant control plane for these types of things to happen. Um, you can kind of slot many different things underneath. You know VMware does it with VCD. I think that you're seeing kind of lots of emergence of you know different ways of doing it. Um, I think having you know the well-published, standardized, well-known APIs either you know through standards bodies or through usage, right? Those are the that's the big thing to make sure that people don't step on each other. It's it's not a problem that's been solved yet. It's one that, that continues to evolve. Even in a single vendor environment. Even in a single vendor environment, because you don't have a single vendor environment anywhere, right? So if you're talking about you know uh, taking a single software uh, ISV vendor, right? Whether it's uh, an OpenStack vendor or you know, uh, VMware or whomever, right? Until they start to actually layer on their own flavors of each of those software-defined places, they still have to interact with, you know, EMC SANs or NetApp filers or, you know, SolidFire arrays. They still have to interact with, you know, Arista switches or Cisco switches, you know, um, and routers. So the concept of being a single vendor environment doesn't exist. So would this be sort of like systems management where that's a nirvana we'll never reach because we're all stuck in the La Brea tar pits right. of you know, someone trying to manage someone trying to manage someone that... Yeah, I think prior, uh, you know, in, 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 in recent history, the, the, the overall you know, unified theory of systems <laughs> management was a, it was a nice to have. I think we're actually entering the time uh, where it's a must have. And so I think a lot of those problems will be solved because if a vendor um, or an ISV um, or even a customer wants to stay in the game as far as being able to deliver the services, they're going to have to go uh, do that work. Okay, so 
Um, VMware that you cited is primarily on-prem. On uh, on they have their own cloud uh, infrastructures also? Yeah, but it's, you know, it's not sort of widely adopted. Um, OpenStack may, may be different, although you know, of the big three, you know, Amazon, Azure, and, and Google, they're not really you know, um, right. in any one of those. Because each of those, they, they roll around, right? right. So they're, their secret sauce to their business and how they deliver their services is based upon the software that they've built in-house. Their own proprietary middleware, exactly. which has open APIs. Yep. But so, um, um, have customers in their own data centers been able to achieve the operational efficiencies that come from programmatic control of their infrastructure. Many have, right? So it's a journey, and we see, you know, when we go and talk to customers, we see, you know, many uh, that have started the journey, many of them that are well along the journey. The, typically, the further along they are, the more proficient ad they get, and the more benefit they, they see from it. And it's traditionally, you know, the, what pushes somebody along that path faster than others is how strategic is their IT to their business, right? So if having, you know, agile development environment, if having, you know, easy to spin up and spin down resources is actually strategic to my business, you know, it deals with my communication to my customer or my order entry or right. my manufacturing or something along those lines that I'm actually, you know, deriving revenue from, um, they tend to be further down the path. If it's more of just a, you know, IT is something that I just consume because it helps lubricate, you know, the communications in my business or helps, you know, kind of just drive the business itself, but it's not really a critical path. They tend to be more on the, you know, the early stages. Is this something then perhaps that is so strategic to Intel in getting the end customers, not the big clouds, but, you know, your traditional IT shops to, um, to be able to achieve the operational efficiencies, oh, get to clo close to the operational efficiencies mm -hmm. that the big cloud vendors do. Is that something then you would invest in, whether it's OpenStack or you know, oh, VMware, yeah, absolutely. to get customers solutions that are closer? You know. Absolutely, and that's actually, that is the goal of our Cloud for All initiative that we've announced, right? It's to get the hybrid and the private cloud uh, instantiations, you know, tens of thousands of those, right? Getting you know, all of the global 2000, the Fortune 500, getting all of those customers delivering in that methodology. Because we know that when we looked at what happened in the large cloud service providers, when you start to make, you know, the per unit cost incredibly low of a resource and also at the same time create the barrier to entry as la very low or the ease of access of those very uh, easy to get to, Jevons paradox kicks in and then you actually see a massive growth in those because the innovation cycle kicks in. So if we were two uh, gentlemen in a bar and we didn't want to go out in the rain uh, to catch a cab, uh, where we didn't have cash in our pocket, and we said, oh, there's got to be a better way to do this. And we, you know, if you napkined out what Uber is today, uh, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have been able to do it, right? You would have had to go purchase servers, you would have had to go find a cola facility, and then you're not going to be able to scale against that, right? Because you know, if I, the first 100 customers that come in have a great experience, but when somebody goes and puts us on social media, this is the best thing ever, right? Then the next 1,000 that come in have a terrible experience and they never come back. So being able to do that programmatic scaling and, and growth of those, um, that is one of those things that has driven, you know, the likes of AWS and Google and uh, Azure uh, forward. If we can go do that same thing in the enterprise space, uh, we're very, very confident that there's a whole set of innovation locked up inside enterprises that will be unleashed the same way. And how much of that is um, a technical challenge? And how much of that is changing work processes? Like, right. you know, the SAN administrator knows a SAN, right. you know, and, and a hyper-converged box, like, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, that, so that is uh, absolutely the biggest problem. It's the people in process, right, that's always right. the biggest challenge. You know, technology tends to, to lead against that. And this is, right. this is probably the third or fourth or twelfth wave, right, depending on what you count of this type of technology trend. You know, I was part of the, the voice over IP transition when I was at Cisco, and you know, we would walk into customers, and, you know, the, the PBX, uh, administrators and the networking administrators hated each other, and they there's just no way that you'd ever get them. The together. bell heads and the net heads. Exactly, but yeah. over time, right? If they as they transition their processes and their value from you know being able to just do the PBX to being able to do the voice on the network, and the network 
uh, staff were able to understand the value of the voice sitting there, and you're able to get those processes to merge, right? That's when the big, um, you know, uptake of that technology and the benefit actually started to be seen. But in this case, our, um, well, you would be in a better position to know than probably anyone in the world how fast um, workloads that would have been done on premise are migrating to public clouds um, and how much time you have to get the people in the processes on the private clouds fixed. Right. So I think one of the things that we're seeing is we're not we're not predominantly seeing that you know mass migration of workloads. I shouldn't right? say my, that's you yeah. you you're capturing a, a, an important point. It's not the migration so much as the new apps. Yeah, the new apps. So uh, absolutely. So apps that are created in that cloud native style. Yeah. Right. Um, is not just happening in you know the AWSs and the Azures, although that is predominantly the first place that they tend to spin up, right? right? We're also seeing that kind of delivery model with this, you know, kind of the new DevOps style of microservices and container, highly automated, orchestrated right. uh, types of situations, Kubernetes and Tectonic and you know Mesosphere and all of those types of you know yeah, words that we hear, all right? They're all kind of wandering here, around, yeah. right? <laughs> so we're seeing that happen even on the the private cloud and the, and then the you know the the smaller service providers too, where somebody will you know say, okay the tools that I have at hand, I'm going to spin up 10 or 15 VMs and then I'll overlay those technologies in there and I'll treat it just as if I was um, in a you know, large public cloud provider. So the methodology for creating those applications absolutely is, is tr taking off the, the, the likes of Docker and you know, Rocket and CoreOS and you know, all of those vendors, you know, Red Hat's Atomic and just, you know, it's, there's this mass explosion of ways of doing application development that are new. Um, the big challenge is giving the best landing platform for that, and we're seeing it happen both in the public cloud and on the private cloud side. Um, to, to what extent do, um, does the buying power um, of the public cloud vendors get to a point where um, there's a meaningful cost advantage, or is the labor cost, um, I guess, what are the economics Beyond right. the, you know, we're going to do new apps in the public cloud, yeah. or some of them, or you know, more of them, and some in the existing. What are the economics that are driving, you know, the choices? It's mostly operational expense, right? So when you look at like an enterprise IT budget, right? Yeah. So predominantly, it's you know, it's a very small slice that actually goes to the capital expenditures, and a very large portion that goes to the operational side of things. And so, you know, reducing the operational expense actually helps balance out, you know, kind of any. Uh, advantage that you know public or private has. You know we've always said from the beginning of time, right, that hybrid wins. Right, that is the best uh, model for you know cloud type of applications. Right, there will be some that you want on your premise because either they have access to in-house systems or security concerns or data gravity concerns. There will be some that you float out into the public cloud either for you know burst capabilities or there's some feature or function that you have out there or get just to get closer to the customer base. Right, right. the you know. Placing your workloads for the right reasons for the application itself is where we think that this actually ends up uh, okay. having the most value. Jonathan, um, I won't call you Jim. <laughs> Donaldson, very Thank much very enjoyed much. having yeah. you. Absolutely. Um, this is George Gilbert. We are at the Julia Morgan Ballroom in uh, downtown San Francisco. And this is uh, Structure 2015. We will be back in a few minutes, thanks.